please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mike Leahy. I am not an alumni of this institution, but my son is, the younger one. Actually used to attend bar over at Woody's. Might have been the best lesson learned he got out of the place. Because um, he still uses that in his restaurant career. Um, but I did spend three tours in Ohio, and so I'm proud to wear these colors. Afternoon. I'm Mike Leahy. I'm the current steward of the Tactical Technology Office. DARPA plays a unique role in the S&T ecosystem. You already heard that. We depend on others for labs, tests, facilities, assets, subject matter experts, and growing our future PMs. We also don't have a monopoly on DARPA-worthy investment ideas, as you've already heard. We do have a big checkbook and all the core supporting capabilities to turn big, hairy, audacious dreams into reality. I am here today to stimulate your imagination, to motivate you to dream about what the future could look like and the outsized role you could have in creating that future. Encourage you to think big, bet big, win big, to join in our mission to redefine possible. I took the TTO mission statement, I created this word cloud. Many of these phrases apply across the agency. At its core, we get the chance to redefine possible. We take a concept from enabling a new game-changing military capability and convert it from PowerPoint to reality. We do the analysis up front to figure out what is the missing immature technology and remove that limitation via a demo at credible scale in real-world environments. We are not limited by the mission boundaries or cultures of the individual services. We work in all four physical domains, air, space, maritime, and ground, I leave the non-physical for other people, and frequent the seams between them. We don't create the effects, but we deliver them to where they need to be effective. Our focus is on platforms, experimental platforms, X-planes, X-ships, et cetera, projects where the laws of nature get a vote. Demo platforms, systems, technologies at credible scale and realistic environments. Real physical systems, high risk, high payoff bets. Let's take a quick trip down memory lane to put our impacts into sharper focus. We'll touch on a few of the wall-worthy past success stories. I've already heard a couple of them. Define size and scope of the platform challenges we take on. That's kind of what the point is to set a context here. Because we do physical things, Many of the touchstones DARPA is known for come from system demos. I can famously quip, when I see software on the cover of Av Week, then I can retire. Stealth, everything unmanned, uncrewed, space access, robotics, walk these lines, it was already mentioned, have blue, anything that had to do with unmanned, starting on the air vehicle side of that house and then going across to the Army, to the Navy, and the others. We were involved in things in quick launch, before SpaceX was SpaceX, before Falcon 9 was Falcon 9, there was Falcon 1 with a little company run by Elon Musk hanging on by his fingernails. And that highlights the success. If we can really do that right, it's not only do we something that the nation needs for national security as a commercial impact as well. And then uh, Sea Hunter, active on the top of there, where famously the Navy sent a memo over to their staff and saying, thou shalt not work with DARPA on that particular project, and now proudly claim those. We'll take that as a transitioning success and we're working on the next steps with that. We'll razz them how we move things across quickly. And that was mentioned in various grand challenges the bottom one, it's still, you know, if you go and watch Black Mirror and watch that one robot episode with Spot there, that's uh, keep you awake at night. There is no overarching detailed plan for how we invest in platforms. We famously don't roadmap or follow a rigid multi-year investment strategy. My strategy is this simple. Find inflection points, make big bets. Today we do that over five, dom we have these, these five different Ds here as I show them. Three, Used to have three for UAV guys. It's aggregated, dispersed, diversified, because we're not really looking at, for the most part, large, big type platforms, looking at how we distribute and disaggregate things, but what the other technologies bring to us and what autonomy enables us to be able to do. Adversary gets a vote, and we're always responsive to national security strategy. So as we are redefining space capabilities with the robotic service and geospace, RGGS, up top, figuring out how to manipulate large things over in space, leading the nation's efforts in hypersonic weapons with tactical boost glider TBG and a hypersonic air breathing concept or Hawk projects, exploring new ways to bring medium size, by that I mean 200 ton ships, into the fight with no manning required ship, no Mars, and sea train, just sea train. We're envisioning liberty ships for the 21st century 
and much more. One constant is we do not do science projects or stunts. We do our homework up front by defining an objective system, or OS, prove to ourselves if we could solve the technical challenges, it would matter. Outline what that OS reference concept looks like, and what elements does DARPA need to bring to life in a demonstration system, or the DS. Are the supporting pieces in place, so now only one consecutive miracle away from building that demonstrator system. This is a particular example of a finished program called Gremlins. Right, the initial concept here was the idea that could we take small UAS and launch and recover them from the air? Launch is the relatively easy part of that, as you know. Recovery a little harder, so that's where we focused. We created the recovery system, put that into a C-130 because they're ubiquitous, not because that would be the end system for that. We had a purpose built a demonstrator, but other than lower brainstem activity, it was stupid because we've done all the other parts we need to do with this. We have improved that could happen in a real world environment. Surprisingly, you learn things that the models didn't, well, unsurprisingly, that the models didn't prepare you for, prove that off, and then move on to something else. So before we dive, launch, or fly into future platform possibilities, just a reminder, we get to do that without limitation to individual physical domains or their seams. As a side note, graphics here are an excellent example of how artist concepts are not always bound by the rules of physics. And we use that art to communicate without sharing elements or projects that should be protected. If you notice the one here on the other side on the bottom for crane, I suppose I could make that fly because I can make a brick fly, but it's never going to actually look like that. Within these four physical domains, we started to ask our spend more time and rediscovered places and spaces. Asking ourselves how those rediscovered environments should influence our investments. How do these environments change how we deter conflict and if called upon, fight and win? Climate change is opening up new transit possibilities in the Arctic while still presenting harsh conditions. Cislunar is the new buzz phrase to describe the space beyond geo to beyond the moon. Right, to put that in context, if I'm sitting here, my finger is the Earth. You know, Leo, or low Earth orbits, so you can't see them. Geo is about this big. This room is cislunar. Right, it's a huge space. It's got some very interesting three-body dynamics in it. It's got some unique kind of places I could hang out. What do we want to do about that? What do we, how do we want to explore that particular space? How do we want to have, if that's the new high domain, right, how do we want to make, take it, advantage of it? Our most recent robotics challenge dealt with the unique challenges faced by our first responders in military and underground environments. The subterranean challenge, or sub-T, please go check out YouTube. It's got some great videos in there. You think you're watching Sports Center for Robots um, in terms of what they were able to put together. But these problems are not solved. And for all the talk about darkening the sky with small sats, most of the world's comm traffic moves on fibers that run across the ocean floor along with rich deposits of high value materials and minerals. In all these cases, the commercial opportunities are every bit or more compelling than the pure military ones. Still with me? Yeah. Yay. With all that as a backdrop, where do we go from here? How do we boldly go where no platform has gone before? or boldly revisit a concept or a technology that some new adjacent discovery gets inside the one consecutive miracle rule. I'm going to take you on a journey where we stop on a baker's dozen excursions into possible futures. I'm going to hint at the endless possibilities out there and encourage you to spend some time and some mental energy helping us redefine possible. Humans have felt the need for speed well before Maverick and Goose. DARPA has always been at the leading edge of high speed. Over the past decade, our focus is on hypersonic, faster than five times the speed of sound, weapons. We're in flight testing now, and can see our way clear of that focus. November is going to be a historic month. Again, we are a projects agency, and while there's plenty of work remaining to fully mature this class of weapon, our role will end for the moment. So where do we go from here? We have explored hypersonic aircraft for decades in fits and starts, and there is excitement building around commercial applications and companies and you hear Hollywood tell it if we already have these challenges solved. But is going faster always the right answer? What if we slowed down? Are there new propulsion concepts that enable us to affordably bridge the gap between the subsonic and hypersonic weapons? If the one in this crowd down the street would understand, are rotary detonation engines, RDEs, or other promising technologies ready to make that leap from lab to credible demo? Our new Gambit project, the BAs on the street now, will give us an answer for that one application. If you know anything about my background, you knew this one was coming. UAS are now everywhere. You can buy a damn capable one from Costco for a couple hundred bucks. So what is the DARPA play? Good question. 
As much as we can and should leverage commercial developments from small systems to visions of electric air taxis, there remains unique military requirements, well, at least ones the military puts more priority on. The artist concept on the left, again, might be physics challenged, evokes the holy grail of a runway independence in a more clever ways than just adding rotors to existing fixed vehicle, vehicle designs. This is ancillary that's coming out in the street. We've had the proposers and developers day four there. This is a quest unblemished by success in recent TTO history. You have to be willing to fail in this business. But when the need and the value are high enough, in this case, organic ISR for dismounted and small ships, you learn your lessons and you try again. And that attempt, as I said, is called Answer. We just put a new concept video on YouTube. Oh, Grant, it's great things we can create to show you what the idea is. But it's not to buy that. It's just the idea of what we want to be able to do. Shifting gears to the right is another concept for the hopeless diamond, right? the high end of the UAS market. Can we reimagine a Predator Reaper for the high end fight? Do advances in electric power, non-kinetic weapons, modern manufacturing materials, active flow control, and other maturing technologies put us at the foot of a next big step forward? Or is the best we can do to continue to evolve, and therefore DARPA should focus elsewhere until we're at that inflection point? Speaking of holy grails, what about combining the need for speed with no good place to land? Thinking beyond just UAS class systems, the ones that could replace an MV-22, carry the same cargo quicker with higher survivability. Do we need to hover or just get in and out of a soccer field? How far, how fast, how big, how affordable? Is there a family of systems or just a group of point designs? Again, are we just one tech miracle away? And if we are then, what is an even crazier idea beyond that one? Going up a little higher in altitude, I'm going to, whoops, there we go. I'm going to show in the iconic white-green graphic from a blackjack program. This is one measure of success for a program, right? If we, everywhere you look and says Peleo, your graphic shows up, you're having a good day. Here we envision the near-term future of a large constellation of affordable space vehicles where teraflops of onboard processing and multiple optical data links within and between the constellations. The white is the commercial, the green is ours inside of there. Even as we struggle with the first tranche of blackjack space vehicles, real building stuff, real hardware stuff, we will already claim a big transition success with the burst of the Space Development Agency, SDA. Phase one of blackjack showed a real solution was feasible, kicked that particular office off. The first objective of blackjack was to convincingly demonstrate the progress being made in the civilian sector could be affordably applied to military applications. That took a full systems program, bus, payloads, brains and integration, it was a classic systems project, opposed from an opposite way that you would ever actually do the problem. So what we said is let's first see if we can get a bus that's affordable, a couple million bucks. Yep, check that box. Can I get a payload of military significance in single digit millions? Yeah, a little more than we thought, but yes. All right, then can I put some smarts on top of that? And then we'll go give that to an integrator to put together and put on orbit. All right, never would be the way you would design an actual system. But in our case, we wanted to do it that way because we needed to show we could do all of those pieces. And until we could do each of those pieces, it didn't matter. It's not about one particular thing we're trying to be able to do. Our focus is on the power of that proliferated LEO constellation. And so we're going to fly an actual ISR RF payload that will enable us to affordably demo that power. Well, other pay what other payloads can you envision that will provide step jumps in traditional space missions or pave the way for new ones? We knew we fell a little short of demonstrating the full potential. Right? If a DARPA program, if you show me a DARPA PM who meets his cost and schedule, I'll show you somebody who isn't trying hard enough. All right. So we knew we might have a few things we backed off. We've got to get the Constellation of Hardware in place. So we stood up the oversight program to close that gap in Constellation Autonomy and bring up more of the true power of what we had here. Now with the SDA stood up and on track to develop their trying zero and contracts in place for one, commercial industry is in a sharp upward vector. Is there a role for DARPA in this space going forward? Should we be watching or investing in ceilings for the next inflection point? Or is it time to leave this orbital domain and focus elsewhere. I could have titled this next topic Next Gen Space Vehicles, but I already know that requires a new generation of space propulsion, so let's just go there. The first image is from our Draco project, and I'm not going to spell that one out. Our current bet is on nuclear thermal propulsion, NTP. That's not a new concept. It's been around since before safety was invented in the late 60s, and you could do extensive ground testing in places like Jackass Flats in Nevada. 
What is new is 30 years of advances in nuclear and material science, a new national space policy on HALU, your acronym for the day, repeat after me, high assay, low enriched uranium, and need to conduct missions in a new piece of space. Prime example of how in many cases multiple vectors need to converge to motivate a big bet. We are betting with NASA that we can conduct an in-space demo by FY26. That opens the door for a range of civilian and military applications. It's a class of DARPA effort. We're going to plant the flag. We're going to drive ourselves to go there because that's what we want to do. We're biased for action. Right now, jump, the thinking is once we have jumped, started NTP, our role here is done for the moment. Can you prove me wrong? In 2024, the partnership of Space Logistics LLC and DARPA will launch a space vehicle with the world's most sophisticated robotics payload. The video starts to play out here. Two large seven degree of freedom manipulators with a range of end effectors and sensors do a whole host of missions on space. Okay, this is the Maytag repairman going up there to be able to fix things. One little anecdotal story, right? If you can, there's a business case for this already, right? On the comms side, if you can keep a comms bird on geo orbit for an additional year, that's about $50 million worth of revenue, right? It has to have an additional year worth of uh, thruster fuel to get to the graveyard orbit. So if you can put more fuel on it and save that year, you can do it for less than $50 million, you've got a winner. If you can go, we've all seen satellites where just one pound of force would make that $1 billion school bus useful instead of derelict. So there's a whole range of applications there. This is one where they were going to go build this arms anyway. We jump started that. I'm going to GFE it to them, right? Because I don't want to be in this business. From the beginning, this pursues a commercial solution. We want to buy this space repair as a service, not to have to own and operate a fleet of servicers. Took two tries, but confident this one will succeed. This system was designed to operate in harsh geo environments for almost a decade. Like many first of a kind systems, it is an exquisite solution. We want to explore a wide range of options. We're going to break the evolutionary path industry would otherwise have to follow, which means it's very expensive. We need to cut the cost and complexity of operations by an order of magnitude, but that's not in this case a DARPA play. NASA and commercial partners looking at assembly and manufacture in lower orbits, it's a lot cheaper space to operate in, have some good momentum already there in place. Have we realized the vision we launched with Orbital Express, which I showed in that earlier chart all those years ago, and earn the right to kick back, drink a cold one, and watch how this plays out for a while? Is there a tougher operating environment than GEO for robots? I'm not looking to settle that argument here, but my deep underwater colleagues can make that case. As in space, there's a wide range of commercial and military applications. Oil and gas industry gives us some great use cases to cut our teeth on. Going a big step beyond our on orbit by completely cutting the cord back to the human operator. I want systems that swim in from a distance, perceive and manipulate objects with minimal a priori information in highly turbid, murky waters. Can't see my hand in front of my face. That's all, without any direct human intervention. As with space, we're hoping our lead investment will encourage commercial investment and the continued growth of an industry where, again, we can buy services instead of systems. And again, in this case, we didn't allow people to go build the fancy hardware on this until they proved the perception algorithms worked for that. Then it could get phase two. What is the next step jump in capability? Is it greater dexterity, sensors, perception, affordability? What will you propose when you get your chances at DARPA PM? To complete the robotic trifecta, we go back to the land. No, not the old Disney Epcot ride. We have built and crashed a fleet of different robotic vehicles over the years. Show one of them now behind or in front of me on this chart. Runs over big ditches, can do almost 65 miles an hour in flat terrain. But do you see that on the battlefield? No. We have a whole bunch of triumphs in mechanical engineering, but failures at the mission level. This is a case where the platform needs to take a back seat to the brains. To redefine the possible here, we needed to redefine our approach. So we created an autonomy-focused project. We provided the physical kit. There's an example of that dune buggy outfitted with the best sensors known to man, the most computing power we could put on the thing. Right? We handed that to everybody who was going to compete. Right? Challenges to solve that perception decision-making problem on the surrogate vehicle, only then do you graduate to the full 10-ton system demo. Want performers to drive those surrogates like a rental. Right? Success is a road littered with broken down vehicles so we can field robotic combat vehicles, RCVs, that don't need remote operators who can run out front and provide true game-changing scout mission capability. This is a prime example of what I call a tranche two project. Right? Years ago, we proved that we could do autonomy 
And so there are autonomous combat system vehicle programs today, but they are limited because they've got to limit the risk they're teleoperated. That's not terribly ta satisfying for us. But they don't have to put themselves at risk to embrace us. Right? That program we're doing there is using the autonomy stack from the Army Research Lab. It's putting other pieces on top of that. Our stated goal is to be able to take tranche three and make it tranche two. Right? To pull forward by a generation what capability will be out there. And the nice part about that is nobody risks it. The money that's currently on the systems will do it. We'll try to be able to compress that down and go to the next thing. Once we can do that, what is next? Should we focus our attention on smaller robots working in close collaboration with dismounted units, as illustrated in the top graphic? We famously had a program called Squad X where we gave them some small robots and they needed them so much they popped smoke to protect the robots when they had to. Or is the future frontier in robotics more the combination of platforms operating in teams across different domains, air and ground, surface and underwater? Is that the key to a fully realized vision for a robot scout? My ground robot PM is here, Stuart Young, with us today. Objective is to pull Army RCV capabilities forward by a decade. How do you want to change the world? I know it's blasphemous, but let's talk less about platforms and more about different ways to deploy and employ them. Illustrated example here is from our recently completed Gremlins project. You saw back in the objective system, demonstrator system example. So the video is playing, it's kicking off this purpose-built uh, kind of demonstrator because there wasn't one we could do there. Launch, of course, is pretty straightforward. Recovery is the challenge. In the demo, we proved it could be done, but not as effectively as originally planned. We had COVID, we had a few other things, we pushed back. We will not give up pet peeve of mine, if we're that close to doing something, we've got to put some additional resources on it. That's not the place we give up for the last few million at the end. Um, so we were able to go and prove that, but what also proved to us is that particular design of that vehicle and that system was never going to get to the goal we wanted, which was four recoveries in 30 minutes. Design just won't do it. Arrow's still hard to solve. So we know what to do until we stopped. And that's another key aspect. If we're not stopping when we learn something, we know how to fix it, then we're not doing our job either. The information's out there now, and figure out how to do it for others. We have looked at launching from underwater before. We do that routinely with missiles, but what about a system that could operate seamlessly across multiple domains? We don't fly over into the A280 environment and swim under it. What other multi-domain crazy concepts are out there? Beyond out-of-the-box deployment concepts, what about novel formations? I retain the advantage of a distributed maritime operations without the transit penalty, right? If I got to create all these small ships and I got to have big ships to carry them somewhere, it defeats the whole damn purpose. The main graphic here is from the Sea Trains project. The math told us that combining four medium-sized vessels, we could get the longer or lower wave-making resistance of a longer, more slender hull and improve their targeting or transit range by over 30%. The audacious goal here was to take four small combat vessels or medium-sized ones join them up outside San Diego, drive them to the inner island chain, have them operate for a few months, hook them up, bring them back on a single tank of gas. All right? Are we going to get that exactly? Probably not. We know nobody will believe that. We've already done in-water tests in the tunnels and other places, but we're going to do a one-third scale demo in the open water because that's the only thing that will convince people that it's certainly worth taking a shot, we think, for us. Then what? What about if I could tow a series of platforms underwater behind the surface ship, which is the bottom graphic? Hitch a ride across the Pacific, get dropped off at the desired location without exposing myself along the way. Not as simple as just hiding a rope on the back of a car, but our studies do show that there are no showstoppers. What are the unique and novel types of formations provide an oversized utility? Almost forgot. Cannot leave the stage without exploring the alternative for the next generation of surface and underwater platforms. The video illustrates the concept for an underwater platform autonomously navigating while carrying a payload of military significance and staying underwater for extended periods of time because it can generate its own electricity. That's the key thing. We can't just stay in one place because they'll find you. You gotta be able to hop up and move around. And you gotta be out there for significant periods of time. If you're only gonna be out there for a month at a time, somebody's gotta come back and get you, it doesn't matter. So this little kite that comes out here, we believe can generate a kilowatt of power. If we can generate a kilowatt of power, right, not only is that eliminate, enough to eliminate the limfac on batteries, but you could potentially have a power station underwater that other people come and get power from. So we're converting that cartoon into reality and exploring a way to harvest energy from small differences in water currents. Differences in temperature offer another possible solution. What else is out there? On the right is the CAD view of our latest unmanned medium surface vessel. This is the first ship since the advent of sail 
designed for keel up to never have humans on board, because once you let humans on board, right, then you have to make it man rated. Like the manta ray, this tough little ship is designed to stay underway for extended periods of time with up to 100 tons of payload. Use your imagination. Autonomously refuel at sea and only come ashore for depot level maintenance, where we pop the hood, right, we pull out the modules, and we slide in new ones and return to the fight. It right, doesn't have to self deploy, it can limp home if it needs to. If we could buy one of these for under 30 million bucks, think of all the trade space it opens up to reimagine what constitutes a surface action group. That ship is another example of second generation autonomy. The first generation was active, now called Sea Hunter. We removed the executive functions but left the rest of the crew. With all that crew gone, now what is the next third generation disruption? Final new platform mindbender I want to leave with you is seams. Seams between domains, doctrine, cultures. Some of the biggest innovative disruptions live in those seams where others cannot visualize or mentally bridge the gaps. Our most recent big example is Liberty Lifter. That, if that conjures up Liberty Ship, that's intended. It's a Liberty Ship for the 21st century, a big boat that lives on the water but operates most effectively in ground effect but can fly to 10,000 feet if needed. A platform that routinely crosses the seam between water and air, hydrodynamics and aerodynamics at home in either. Again, you can look up those videos on YouTube. Again, reference design for what we want to do. It's capable of performing a range of traditional Marine, Navy, and Air Force missions, yet not something any individual service would invest in. So I joke, I need to get the Navy interested so the Air Force will try to steal it back. But again, this is just one example what other ones are out there that enable a new class of systems or a whole new approach to delivering effects on the battlefield. What seams can we exploit together? The point of this briefing was not to prove I could entertain you for 35 minutes or so. Hopefully something I said triggered your imagination or made you realize there was a government agency who was maybe just crazy enough to make your dream a reality. Like all the tech offices, we have a broad, an office-wide broad area announcement, or BAA, to which you can submit white papers and proposals. But before you go to that trouble, I strongly encourage you to scan our list of PMs on the DARPA website. Reach out to the PMs who might be interested and receptive to your ideas. We, have co of course, post our RFIs and BAAs to the appropriate government site and hold industry days. Along with PM and project histories, our public website has a unique range of resources of how you can work with us. One final note. As you may have become evident to some of you in the audience, I was being very careful with my scenarios and examples. While there's a wide range of future platforms we can talk about openly, when we get into performance specifics, we need to protect that level of information properly. We also have the means to do fully informed projects and germinate special concepts in special spaces. Have your security people call our security people. This guided tour of the future is over, but Hopefully, you will have continued to dream big and maybe one day join us to bet big and win big. And now with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leahy, for that fascinating look at the future of military platforms and some of their applications. I just want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Eric Butterbaugh from the DARPA Public Affairs Office, and I will be moderating the Q&A sessions for our DARPA speakers today and tomorrow. We'd like to remind you to please submit your questions through the virtual event platform, accessible via the QR code on the screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can each session, and we encourage you to engage with our speakers during breaks as well. We're eager to continue these conversations with you. And with that, we'll take our first question. Dr. Leahy, does an idea have to have a direct military application for TTO to consider it? I would say for both TTO and the agency, it has to have a national security consideration. And we can sometimes take a broad interpretation of what national security might be, uh, but yes, it is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and so there has to be a link to that. As I alluded to, some of the best things we could possibly do would then have military uh, dual uses, if you will, I love to take that Liberty Lifter and actually have it be in the craft fleet. You know, someday, um, things we're doing on robotics and space and others uh, for that. So a really great project will have other uses for it, but at its heart, it's got to be about giving the warfighters some advantage they didn't have on, on the battlefield. Thank you. 
Well, as we heard about all these uh, fascinating new applications and potential platforms, what are the skills and experience uh, qualities that you look for in TTO for potential program managers? Um, several. Um, one, got to have a big motor. Right, got to have a lot of energy. I mean, these, the assignments we give people are rare pearls, right? That, as Stephanie mentioned, it's four to five years running fast. We've got to go and change the world. So you've got to be willing to do that. It's got to be the right time in your career that you can put that energy into that. You've got to be passionate about what you do. You have to be technically knowledgeable about it. And you've got to be willing to listen. That's a big one, right? Because I, you are never going to be always the smartest person in the room. And you gotta, we can put great teams around you. You've got to be able to listen to them. So tell people that's not giving up any control of your project. It is yours. You're responsible for being able to make it happen. Figure out how to bring those teams together and be able to do those kind of things. So that's kind of a nutshell. And in our case, because of the complexity of the systems we do, as you saw there, we don't do anything small. Right? We spend hundreds of millions of dollars when we set off to go do these. So we're going to take people in their mid-career who this is not their first rodeo. We have some experience operating in the security environments we need to and managing complex systems programs. Those are kind of the attributes that we look for. Great, thank you. And for the audience here in person and those watching online, what's the best way to pitch an, an idea? Uh, best way is to find at some conference or another place, corner a PM who knew how to like interest and convince them that he could be very successful if he took your idea. Um, you gotta be willing to offer it up, right? Because we're gonna compete it. Right, so you come to us in the BA or something else and help us in the front end of something. It should be because if you're industry, you think you can still win that even though once we're convinced and put it out into an open competition for it. So it's that having that dialogue with them, um, being able to, uh, you can send stuff to us, have your reps, we talk to them at various places and everything. But you know, just sending something across the transom really doesn't you know, work for that. And sometimes it is, they'll have a different idea that comes from a different place and then it, it, that they don't end up bidding on it in the end. Great, another question. Um, what excites you the most about these, these future technologies that you talked about? Um, I think it's the chance uh, to really do something that moves the needle, right? We, we pride ourselves on wanting to go after everything that's a step jump in capability or something that will put a new class of system. It doesn't always work out that way. Uh, we never step off on doing a new project that we don't believe there's a reference design and can do it but it doesn't mean it's a slam dunk. Right? If I knew what the end state was, if I knew what the budget was, do the whole program that I will famously say that I shouldn't do it. Right? We're gonna discover things along the way and it's that discovery and working with very smart people from both the industry and the rest of the ecosystem and our PMs to try to make something happen that wasn't there before. Right? We're about to step off on a program in undersea propulsion that is going to change forever how, if we're successful, and it's by no means assured, Right, that how we design subs into the future. For those in the Air Force side of the audience, it's like before Havlu. There was Havlu and then there was Stealth and everything changed after that. Same thing we're trying to do here. So those opportunities to be involved in something, help nurture it, help get it to the point where we can get it done and put it out there and physically demonstrate it, that's, that's the reason I'm here. Great, thank you. Obviously, without getting into operational details that you said sometimes are, are, are sensitive, can you share some challenging operational scenarios with, this, with the audience that are kind of near the top of your mind? Nah, not any good detail. Um, so I, I think, you know, it is for us at its heart in TTO, right, because we don't create the effects, right? We're like BSF. I don't create the effect. I make it better. I and in this case, I deliver it. Right, so it's those getting, finding a way to deliver that effect to the place it has to go to, right? Whether that's to overcome whatever the adversary is putting in way of that, or whether that drove a survivability challenge, a range challenge, a power challenge, you know, something that we can put together in a system that will allow us to change that. So that cuts a lot of scenarios. I'll talk to one, uh, which is, um, you know, which saw a Liberty Lifter, right? In the Pacific, in the future, all right, if we get into a conflict, we're, gonna, we're not going to be rescuing and pulling one person out of the water at a time, unfortunately. All right, so the idea of something like Liberty Lifter that can carry 100 tons, that has two hulls, that could literally be a hospital that's flying through and collecting people on one side, triaging them, helping them on the others, you know, those kind of things. So all those kind of scenarios. We look for ways, as Stephanie said early on, what's the alternative path to a solution, right? Not A or B, but what is C? 
Um, so those are the ones we try to be able to get to. But as I said, there's no, you know, as things change and go forward, another kind of thing we're always trying to make sure of is that I sometimes joke I gotta make my platforms and my demos a little too ugly because I'm not wanting you to buy that thing. The path to the thing is I wanna do an X plane and bound it and I wanna do a Y and then I wanna do production. If I'm successful with that Y, I'll MVP it and I can put it out in the field for a little while, what I wanna be able to do, but otherwise, I don't. So we want to add options to the acquirer, not take them away, because in the time it takes us to demonstrate, even at DARPA, four to five years, the world may be a different place. And we ought to have those options. We're trying to find a class of things that's relevant and can be done, and then let the acquirers figure out how they actually want to do it. Great. We've got time for one final question. How do the commercial markets enable classified work on hard technology? Um, well, a couple different ways. A lot of folks, some folks who have uh, commercial also have uh, elements that they have the technology in place. Um, for those who don't, uh, there's a program we introduced at our last uh, DARPA Forward called Bridges, which is an attempt to be able to take people who have great ideas that are probably then going to be classified but aren't in the classified ecosystem yet, and be able to link them in and bring them in. You can look that up on our website uh, for what you want to do with that. Also, I think it's like when we looked at uh, Blackjack, it wasn't so much that we were going to use the commercial line directly. We're going to use the ideas and the concepts and the processes and procedures for militarily relevant things to be able to do. So we're always looking for ways that we can spin in uh, different activities along with spinning them back out. So there's a range of ways we try to do that. Uh, we try to make sure that we don't overclassify things. There's a lot of projects uh, that we do, uh, TBG, Hawker examples, that those were designed, why they look the way they do and why you don't see them on the wall because it's auto motor lines are protected, it's because we did fully informed analysis up front. But then for most of that project, it can be done in just plain level secret. Right? So we're always trying to find ways to figure out, make that connection, but then break it down to the lowest denominator we can, be able to protect it properly, and make sure we get to use it first. Great. Well, thank you all for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Leahy, for this uh, really fascinating look into the future. Thanks again.